Today we have an exciting, exciting um, time ahead of you. You are going to be amazed. You probably already are because you've heard her bio. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Alicia Abella with us again. Uh, Alicia, thank you so much for being with us. This is an extreme pleasure and honor for us to have you. We had the privilege of uh, having you in person about five years ago before mm -hmm. the pandemic in Addison, uh, Texas, and, uh, and you were still located in, in, uh, in Texas at the time, and I know that you've relocated, and actually you've assumed a, a new position as well. <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, it's just a way of, of kicking off, you know, it's been, a, it's been five years. How did you do during the pandemic? Has everything gone well with you? And, uh, and you know, um, it's been five years since we've seen each other, you know, so it's great to see you again. Well, likewise, uh, Ignacio, it's lovely to be here, lovely to see you again, lovely to see you doing well. It has certainly been um, a couple of years of some surreal times for everyone, so um, especially happy to be able to have this opportunity with you and the audience today. Um, I've been doing well, as you suggested. There has been some change in my life. When we last met, I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I was working for AT&T, the company that I worked for for 25 years before um, officially retiring from AT&T after those 25 years and then joining Google. So I am now working for Google and I am back closer to my roots living in New Jersey and just a stone throw away from New York. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, you, you've got such an incredible story and, and I am just amazed by the things you've done, you know, uh, in your life. It, it's just incredible. Um, but maybe you could share with our audience today a little bit of your story. You know, your parents, where they came from, uh, you know, where you were raised and, and all of that. That would be so, I think, helpful for the students to understand a little bit more about you. Yes, of course. Happy to do that. So I come from parents that immigrated to the United States from Cuba in the 1960s and they settled down and actually met in New York City, uh, specifically in Queens. So for anybody out there who's from Queens, uh, I grew up in Elmhurst, Queens, and I was also educated in, in New York. I did my undergraduate at New York University and then I did my PhD at Columbia University. So New York City is definitely a, a place that's close to my heart. and I, uh, I, was, um, I was taught, I think, as a result of certainly my parents' um, wish when they came to this country, and I was born in, in the United States, to ensure that the best thing they could give me, um, because they did not come from big means, they were hardworking, middle-class uh, families, was an education. And so I grew up as an only child, and they instilled in me the importance of getting an education that the only thing they could give me was that, which was to me phenomenal. <laughs> that was all I could ask for. And where I was going to be able to then stand on my own two feet was going to be as a consequence of what I had in my head and what I could bring from what I had learned uh, to be able to support myself going forward. Uh, I have to say that when I started down the path of my education, I never could have imagined some of what I have been able to do, the people I've been able to meet, like yourself, and the places that I have visited as a result. So I hope to have a little time to share some of that with you too. But that's just a, a quick, uh, brief description of my uh, my childhood and uh, and what was important growing up sure sure no no it's it's extremely important for everyone to understand you know where where your background is and and uh, and who you are as a person you know it's so important and and you know growing up um what did you think you would want to do you know as, when you were young you know because mm -hmm. when you're younger you you have a certain impression of what you want to do in life Mm -hmm. And then when you become a little bit older, that kind of changes mm -hmm. for some. Mm -hmm. And what did, what, did, what did you see your as, you know, when you were as a child growing up in the, in the yes. future? Yes. 
that's a great question. Um, I have to say that I think early on, I had a real interest in science and math, which is eventually um, where I crafted my whole uh, education and career from. And I would say that that started in elementary school. And I'll never forget sort of the first time that I got to participate in a science fair. And I had to uh, do posters and I had to, there was a judging that took place and I had to really know my stuff because I wanted to win because <laughs> I wanted first place. <laughs> and uh, as I was fiercely ambitious and competitive, um, and I should say I still am. But I did a, a, uh, a project on uh, the dissection of a, of a little fetal pig at the time. So it was biology, even though I never went into biology. But right. I think that's when sort of the worm turned for me. Like I said, oh, you know, I really enjoy the science. And um, even though later on I went on, on to study computer science, which is very much more focused on the engineering side than on the um, biology and, and uh, life sciences, I think that's when that interest happened. And then the interest for computer science, I recall very vividly also, that happened in high school. When I was in high school, I have to uh, probably um, kind of put a little context around it for the audience. So this was a time um, in the mid 80s, 1980s. And so this was a time before Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and none of that, like these, they were still in their garages, right? So right. computers, as we know it, were not anywhere near where we think of today, where we, in fact, carry them in our pockets now, right? Because our phone is a computer now. Um, it was a time when computers were just coming up and, and they were being accessible to people like you and I. And I remember having a class in high school where it was a, a very basic programming class that was being taught as an elective. And right. I elected to take that class. I happened to be the only girl in the class, um, and it still seems to be the case that engineering, computer science tends to be much more dominated by, by boys uh, and men yeah. than girls. It was true then as well, but I really enjoyed it. And I, what I enjoyed about it was the problem solving aspect of, of programming and computer science. And I realized that once I took that class that this would be a good area for me to study in college. And so that's what led me to study computer science as an undergraduate at New York University. And, and there were also very practical reasons that motivated me to do that, because I knew that the university was going to be expensive. My parents had saved their entire careers to be able to afford to send me. And I wanted to make sure that when I graduated, I would graduate with a degree in a field that I'd be able to find a job in quickly and easily that it wasn't going to be a big, a big difficulty. And because computers were starting to appear on everybody's desk, I figured there'd be some, a need always uh, sure. for somebody who knew yeah. how to operate these computers. Right. And right. it wasn't, right. again, until uh, a little later on when I had an internship as an undergrad that I realized just how much you could do with computer science. And that's what led me down the path of uh, pursuing a PhD in computer science in order to do research in computer science. Right. So that right, was a right. long story, a long path, no, a long no, journey to answer that's your question. And, and you know that, um, you know, as was mentioned, you know, in your in your bio, um, Columbia University recognized you with a very prestigious award uh, for with the merit of excellence, I believe it was um, for an individual who's under the age of 45, who's done outstanding work and, and you were um, the first engineer, I believe, to ever receive mm -hmm. this award. And, and you know, that's just a, a testament in, in to who you are. Obviously, to be recognized at that level, at that university, and to be not just the first engineer, but the first female engineer as mm -hmm. well, um, that speaks a lot in terms of, you know, what, what you have done and what you continue to do. I'm always so impressed by the things that happen and in your present position today with, with uh, Google Cloud, you're the managing director of telecom, mm -hmm. uh, media, entertainment, um, mm -hmm. 
uh, finding its Industry Solutions Corporation responsible for North America and, and all Latin of, America. Yeah. All of Latin mm-hmm. America. Um, wow. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when you think of Google just in itself and, and you think of the of cloud, and that's that's everything today, and it's all evolving. And when you think about the areas of responsibilities that you have, you're at the cutting edge of everything that's mm-hmm. happening worldwide. Mm-hmm. And in the company that's recognized worldwide is probably the leader in all of this. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know what your days are like, but you know, they have to be <laughs> very, very, uh, either very strenuous or really, really very interesting as mm-hmm. well. But can you tell us a little bit about what you do on a daily mm-hmm. basis, you know, in this you know, position you have is, is mm-hmm. with Google Cloud? Sure, sure. Um, and uh, I couldn't agree more with you, Ignacio. I, uh, part of the reason why I joined Google was because of that, um, that opportunity to continue to work uh, on innovations, on inventing the future, on being part of activities and problems that still don't have answers, right? We're still right. researching what they are. And um, as far as what I do, um, as you said, um, what, what does it mean to be a managing director of telecommunications, media, and entertainment at Google Cloud? Um, I should probably start with describing a little bit Google Cloud, because Google, or Alphabet, as it's sometimes called, has multiple lines of business um, under the umbrella of Alphabet. Um, sometimes they're called big bets. And Google Cloud was one of those organizations that came out of a big bet, and it reports up into Alphabet. Um, You might also uh, know uh, YouTube. That's another organization line of business. And Google Search is another one and so forth. And so Google Cloud was stood up um, several years ago to be able to serve the products and solutions that Google creates for large companies, what we call enterprise customers. So my specific industry is telecommunications, media and entertainment with a strong focus on telecommunications because I spent 25 years working for AT&T. And so I know a lot about telecommunications. And so in my role as the managing director for all of the Americas, my day-to-day job is interfacing and engaging with clients from across um, the telecommunications industry across that region. What that means is that I will uh, typically meet with CEOs, CTOs, CIOs of companies, like the senior level executives of the companies to work with them on some of their digital transformation journeys, how they're going to modernize the way they do business? How are they going to start moving to the cloud? Because that's kind of the future. That's, in fact, the future is here because many companies have already started to utilize the cloud to be able to um, allow their employees, for example, to access the, their services and programs from wherever they are to enhance the ability for workers to be mobile because everything sits in the cloud. It's not sitting locked up on your desk on a computer. And so it's really helping those clients figure out how they're going to do that, how they can use some of Google's products and technologies to help them generate new revenue opportunities, help them provide better customer experience for their customers. So I do a lot of that um, engagement with clients. Because I work with clients, I, I do do a lot of traveling. It was difficult in the beginning during the pandemic because we everything was locked down. So when I joined Google, in fact, it was right at the height of the pandemic in 2020. But now things have opened up. And so I will travel. Um, I, I travel throughout the United States and I also go to uh, to South America, Latin America. In fact, I have a, a trip very soon to Brazil to meet with clients there. So it's it's very exciting. And what's interesting for me having come from working with one telecommunications company is now working with so many and they all have their nuances and their different strategies, what they want to do. And then when you throw in the different regions, Canada, US, and especially Latin America, the challenges are different and there's regional nuances. 
um, that you have to take into consideration. And I will tell you one thing, Ignacio, one thing that's helped me also is knowing Spanish, right? That's part yes. of what's important yes. in Latin America. I can go in and have a conversation with the client in Spanish and it completely changes the dynamics. They are so happy Absolutely. to be able to speak yeah. to someone uh, in the native ta uh, native language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So very important so, you to know, pick that up. <laughs> yes, yes. So along your journey, um, you know, when you started out, you know, what were some of the obstacles you would have encountered, to, you know, when you were just getting going, you know, in your professional okay. career? Um, you know, you're, you're, you're a woman in a male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, were there any um, mentors that you had along the way that really helped pave the way for you? Uh, or did you have to just, you know, grit through it on your own mm. and, and, and eventually get to this high level that mm. very few people have ever accomplished in their lifetime? Uh, you know, what was, you know, what, what kind of challenges did you have along the way or, or how did you overcome them? Yeah, um, I guess, yes, there, there's, um, there's always challenges, obstacles. Um, I'm not sure that they were necessarily any different than other uh, other challenges and obstacles that others face just starting out as, as a junior person, uh, or maybe I just didn't see them or didn't think of them in, in that way. When I, when I was um, just starting out and I was a researcher, I didn't look at myself as a, as the, as a woman researcher. I was just a researcher. And, right. uh, and, um, and even though I was, quite often and still am the only woman in the room. Maybe I've gotten used to it, but I don't really notice it either. Um, right. But I did have mentors and, uh, and that I'm sure has, and that has helped. And, and maybe that's why I didn't see it because they, they were so helpful to me throughout my career. And some of the things that some of my closest mentors did for me, especially early on was to really give me opportunities to, um, to get up in front of audiences, to get in front of the senior management within the companies, to have that face-to-face -face an opportunity to, to shine. Uh, and sure. because they could have easily been the ones doing the presentations, talking about the work, but they would give me the opportunities to do that. And that made it so that other, they would know who I was, get to know me. And then when promotional opportunities happened, they knew who I was and they are, Hey, you know, uh, we know Alicia has done this work. We know she can do this. You know, maybe she's somebody that we should promote. So there's this notion of mentors, which help coach you along the way and give you those opportunities. And then there's what I would call sponsors, which are the ones right. that actually stand behind you and, and pull you up and say, and are the ones who are going to be talking about you when you're not in the room. Uh, and and paving the way for those opportunities. So I have had both. Um, and, uh, you know, earlier on, did, you, you go ahead. Ignacio. How did you identify a sponsor or did the sponsor find you? Yes, in my case, the sponsor picked me. Um, oh, okay. And I okay. think probably that's how it works the best. Because uh, sure. sometimes you might pick somebody, and, but they're not in a position to, to be the sponsor. So it could be a little awkward. So in this case, um, it, it was, uh, they picked me and it, it happened to also be, you know, within the same organization, the same uh, sort of senior leadership command, because they are the ones who, who had the most visibility to me. I, even though I tried to go across different business units, they didn't know me the way my immediate uh, chain of command did. Sure, sure. In, in terms of role models, you know, growing up, you know, who, who did you look to, you know, in terms of uh, direction, you know, uh, this is, uh, this is what I'd like to do someday. Um, you know, who did you admire? You know, who did you respect? Uh, your, your parents and family obviously come into play, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, that's usually the way that I have to answer that question. Um, my, my, my parents, for sure, they were role models. When I see what they did, how they came to this country with very little, not knowing English, not, you know, it's just having to start afresh. Um, you know, that kind of, you, it, you can't help but be inspired by, by that. And their um, advice to me about education and the importance of that, the fact that they were always supportive in whatever I chose to do 
they did not force me to go into science. I just happened to do that. Um, it was really totally up to me so long as I got an, a, a college education. Um, and then there was that aspect, certainly from my mother of, of um, saying that I could do anything a man can do too. So maybe that also was a little bit in my ear. Uh, then, good talk. Uh, it was good a good thing. talk and it helped when in fact I am usually the only woman in the room. So right. I'm sure all that played, played a role. Yes, yes. And, and being the only woman in the room, has that uh, ever presented itself as, a, as an obstacle or a challenge to you? I know you said, you know, you don't, you don't even view it like that anymore, but you're in some very, very high level meetings. With, yeah, uh, you know, there, that, there, yeah, there have been times, there have been times when, um, especially when the conversation might get a little heated <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And uh, it, it's just a, a, a physical difference between men and women that their men's voices tend to be louder. And so it's sometimes hard to interrupt or interject when you want to say something. And so I have to say that um, this technology that we have now gotten used to using during the pandemic of Zoom calls or Google Meets or right, have actually helped kind of even the playing field, because at least at Google, we're all very respectful about making sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. And so you, you, we are very uh, good about raising that hand when you have a question. And if somebody raises their hand, you go in turn on who, who's raised their hand and you make sure that everybody's heard. I think that that technology has actually helped um, with those situations where it's kind of difficult to interrupt. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in in, uh, in the intro, uh, in you know, in your bio, you talked about um, you have twenty nine patents. Uh, uh, some of these are in some uh, voice recognition, I believe, autonomous vehicle. I mean, there's so, so many. How do you get a patent? How do you go about doing something that requires a patent? Mm -hmm. So, uh, while at AT and T was where I got all my patents, and AT and T had a, a whole organization of patent attorneys and their job was to work very closely with the uh, with all of the, the company but very much so with the folks that were the researchers the people creating uh, the inventions and uh, kind of writing the papers of what might come come up next and thinking about what might be next and so um it was basically my research work that I was working on that would get patented. And we had a big support system internally for how those would get chosen. And, you know, you, you would write the, the patent up, but they would also help guide um, whether it should be submitted, um, how it could be augmented. So um, we, had, we had support like that because at t recognized the importance of intellectual property for the company because this is also a source of revenue opportunity for them you know when you work for a company and you, your ideas are not yours they're the companies they belong to the company and so when i have those patents those patents belong to at and t um, but that was part of what you did um, uh, in your role was to file those patents and and it's ironic now because there's a lot of conversation about chat bots and generative right. ai and my very first patent was, in fact, in an area that I would now probably call generative AI. It was about dialogue management, how to have a conversation with the machine. That was my very first patent. And I have it on a plaque and I still have it in my in my office wall. Amazing. Amazing. You know, I, you've done such great uh, work in, in the area of technology and you were recognized. Uh, by the Women in Technology International and in, 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 now you're in their Hall of Fame. Um, and you've done so many other things. Uh, but one of the things you also were involved with was the President's uh, Commission on uh, Ex uh, Hispanic Excellence in Education. Uh, what did that work involve, you know, and how did you get appointed to that or do? Yeah, oh my gosh, Ignacio, this is one of those examples um, when we started our conversation that I mentioned that I would never imagine uh, being a part of, right? Here I was, you know, okay, so I'm I'm studying computer science, I want to be a programmer, then I find that I could do research in computer science, and then I get a PhD, and I'm like, okay, I'm working at AT&T. Well, I would never have imagined that, that I would be sitting in the White House and having an opportunity to work for President Obama. It's just like, right. how does that happen? Like, right? So I'll tell you how this happened. Um, 
And a lot of it has to do with the other part of my uh, work that um, I've always enjoyed doing, which is not my day job, but it's really working with the Hispanic community, with young people, helping to inspire them to go to school, to, to, to go into to science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, being a, a vice president of a nonprofit organization for a while that was dedicated to that mission. Um, part of that is what helped me get on the, the Obama um, uh, White House Commission for Educational Excellence for Hispanics. And I, I remember the day it happened, I was uh, given an award by the Hispanic Business Magazine and the award was going to be given out at a luncheon in Los Angeles. Now I'm at this point in New Jersey, I was gonna to go to Los Angeles to receive the award. There were five women who were being recognized um, for their contributions. I went to the luncheon and only two of us were there in the, in the, in the room. I don't know why the other three couldn't make it for whatever reason. And so I remember the editor of the magazine asking if I could help him during the, the luncheon, because now he was down a few people, he needed somebody to moderate a panel. And would I please moderate the panel? I said, sure, fine, no, not a problem. So I moderated the panel. And then he says, oh, and can, can I ask you to also give the closing remarks during the, the luncheon? <laughs> and so while I ate my lunch, I wrote the closing remarks. And then by the way, I also had to give my own remarks when I got the award. So the reason I tell that is because I was on stage three different times in front of an audience right. that was relatively intimate. There were about a hundred people in the audience, but I got a lot of stage time. After the event, as is the case with many of these events, uh, I got approached by lots of people to congratulate me. They gave me their business cards and I promptly put them in my briefcase. And right. I went and I, and I w w decided to uh, walk Hollywood and, and tour Los Angeles because, in fact, I had never been. And it was a few weeks later. I was sitting at my desk and my phone rings. And I pick up the phone and the person on the other end of the line uh, says that we had met at this event in Los Angeles. And uh -huh. now I don't remember because there were so many people that were there. But I decide as I'm uh, talking to him about the weather and pretending that I know him, <laughs> looking through my briefcase to see if I could find the, the business card. And I look at the business card, I do find it, and I realize it has the presidential seal on it. And I, at that moment, I thought, wow, like, what is this? <laughs> and that's when he tells me that, uh, you know, we met at the event. He thought that um, I would be really good for this commission that was going to advise the president on policies related to reducing the educational gap that exists in the Hispanic community. And mm -hmm. so he says, would you like to, to be involved in this? Um, and I said, yes. And he said, well, do you want to think about it? And I said, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I did have to uh, uh, confirm, I'm like, you mean president, like President Obama? Because he said president. I was like, I, I, just to make sure it wasn't some other president, but some other, it's like a company. No, no, no. He said, no, the president of the United States. So, um, so for six years, I served alongside um, 29 uh, other commissioners from different parts of, uh, of the country, different areas. Some of them were elementary school teachers. Some of them were presidents of universities. Some were uh, lawyers, mostly all were in, somehow involved in the education system or um, providing uh, guidance from uh, like the science perspective or the private sector perspective. But they were just wonderful individuals, all working towards a, a, the common cause. And, uh, and yeah, it was quite an honor. Probably wow. the highlight of my career, honestly. Really? Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. And you've had so many. Yeah. Wow. That, that, that's, that's incredible. Well, that one was that's special, cool. right? Because that's something where, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to set a foundation for the future leaders, for the, the right? Those that I'm, I'm trying to pay it forward. I'm trying to make it so that we leave to the young people under the age of 30 today, something that they can then take and run with, right? That we don't destroy it, that we're actually trying to make it a better place for them to take into the future. Sure, sure. So, so with that, what, what would you say 
is the biggest challenge facing facing our students and you know in education today? Oh, uh, well, I think I think the big price tag is is uh, an impediment, right? It's so costly um, to go to university today. Um, that's probably a big one. Um, yeah, because I mean, it was something even big when I was going and now it's only gotten worse. So I think that right. Right. that divide right. is pretty big. Um, I think maybe the, the other one I would mention, Ignacio, is there seems to be also a lot of distraction for our young people. Um, and it's like um, you don't know where you're going to focus the attention because there's so many things coming at us now through social media, uh, right, our social networks. How do, you, how do you figure out what's the best thing to do, what kind of advice to listen to, who to listen uh, to about it? Because there's just there's so much chatter and so much um, that I think more than ever, you know, young people do need that guidance on how to do things. I'm always surprised, like and now that I'm at Google, I'm like, I'm, I'm even more surprised. But when I was going through that process of going through high school and then applying to colleges and applying to graduate school, Google search did not exist. There was no way to find information on the internet, right? Uh, we had to go to the library, <laughs> physical library, <laughs> right? right? And, and, and get books or find out, for me, find out what were some of the fellowship opportunities that I could apply to to help me pay for college. Well, that was in a book in a library. But now there's so, it, it, the, the information is so easy to access. And yet, I find students have troubles finding that information. And so I think guiding them to how to find that information, what's the right information is very important because that's kind of how they're going to get started and where we're going to, and then the rest is up to them because it is, it, it does take hard work. So that's another, that's probably my third um, message and third point. Um, you know, there's, I often hear people say, you can do anything you want to do. And I have a little bit of a problem with that statement. And the reason is because it should be um, qualified. Yes, maybe you can do everything you want to do, so long as you put hard work into it. And so right. long as it's within your limits to do it. Like, I would love to be a, you know, an NBA basketball player, but that's never going to happen, <laughs> right? Because I am not six foot six, sure. right? <laughs> sure. So, so that's why I'd like to say, you know, Better than that, it's the advice I would give is it's important to have dreams. It's important mm -hmm. to have something and a goal that you set for yourself that you think is attainable. And then you work hard towards that goal. Now, when, you, when you're young, uh, having those dreams is important. And I dare say, even as we get older, it's important still to have dreams as well. Right. Um, so that's having those dreams helps you set a goal. Having a goal helps you figure out, okay, now that I have that goal, what are the steps I need to take to get there, right? Because there's always going to be those steps. There will be obstacles, and, but at least yeah. you'll know I got that goal. I can overcome this obstacle because I want to get there. Sure, sure. No, great advice, great advice. Um, you know, just thinking, you know, of everything you do in the course of a day, uh, all the travel you have, all the responsibilities mm -hmm. you have, um, so what do you do in spare time? Do you, do you read? Do you have any hobbies? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what, uh, do you go to the opera? I don't know. What, yeah. what, 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 what do you like to do? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, let's see. Um, I, I definitely like to, I like music. So I like, and I like dancing. So I, I do take Zumba classes. So I, I like Zumba. Oh. Um, so, and that yes. to me is like a, a stress reliever, um, right? Just to be, uh, surrounded by music and sort of just letting it go for an hour. And one thing that I also picked up that I really, really enjoy, and it, it came as a result of the pandemic, in fact, is taking long walks and going hiking in the woods and uh, among nature. That was something that I, I hadn't discovered until the pandemic, but that kind of forced us to kind of try to get out and do something and not be in the four walls. Um, and I've continued to do that with my, my husband. And so that's, that's a fun activity for me. And, uh, and, and, you know, just spending time uh, with the family and uh, 
having time with friends as well. That's something that I think has become even more important as I've gotten older is the importance of friendships and cultivating and maintaining them. Naturally in life, we, we go through stages, right? There's the friends you made when you were younger and then you get married and you have kids and somehow the friends kind of take a pause, right? And then you, you pick up again when the kids get big. And so that's where I am right now, right? My son's already finished college and now we're kind of on our own. And so we're picking up those friendships again and it's wonderful. Wow, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's, uh, so is your son uh, going to Columbia or is he... Uh... My son graduated from New York University, so he went to my undergrad alma mater. Out of the same, out of the same path. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he didn't go down the, the the STEM path, although it's it's similar. He did go into the gaming industry, so he's in game ah, design. Game design is you... what he studied. Yeah. Yes. That's... So he's an avid gamer himself, and so when he was looking for a, for a major, I said, "Well, you know, there's," and I didn't even know this existed, but NYU has a program specifically for for gaming gaming programming development design the business of gaming a whole center around gaming and so i said that sounds like a pretty good one and he agreed yeah. so um so he's now uh working at a startup where he's using his game design um knowledge and developing curriculums in fact to teach young kids how to do game design and game development and using it to also help with children that are neuro atypical um, because mm -hmm. it, it turns out that the, the gaming and that aspect um, helps them with their social skills. Right, right. It's so, it, that is just a huge industry today. I mean, I, I have young boys that are gamers as well. They're, they're, they're always, mm -hmm. you know, involved with that. And I had one that wanted to go into that industry. And I know about New York University because uh, of his interest in that. So, there yes, you go. It's, it's a, yeah, yeah. And, and we continue to evolve in society in you know in in these fields and and so there's there's opportunities uh, abound but you know is there one uh, some closing thoughts you'd like to share you know we've got thousands of, of young people today uh mm -hmm. listening to you is there some advice counsel a message you'd like to leave with them today let's see there's several i think i've already touched upon my main one but i'll reiterate it because i think it's important to to mention it again uh, you know, the importance of having dreams. Um, and, and, and that is because that will help to set a goal. And then you can then figure out the steps you need to get there. Right. Um, right. I think it's important always, always um, to not be afraid to ask questions, to not be afraid to seek help from, you know, some of the you know, older people, whether it's the teachers or, or friends or family members, the importance of, of asking questions and taking advantage of the resources at your disposal in the school, for example, or even in programs like this, right? Taking advantage of that and making those connections because those people, they, more often than not, people wanna help, but they don't know if you need help if you don't ask for it. So I think, um, that's that's an important one as well. Um, I was I was always kind of shy growing up, and I, I hated asking anybody questions uh, to the point where I was like, yeah, my mother would sort of push me to to ask questions of anybody just to get me comfortable with it because it's it is uncomfortable for many people, but that's very important. And then I think my third recommendation, if you can do it, and maybe it's uh, sometimes it might feel uncomfortable and you have to get outside your comfort zone a little bit, but where possible, try to take leadership opportunities and they don't have to be big leadership opportunities. I mean, maybe, maybe it's um, volunteering to uh, be the person at, um, you know, the, the Friday, uh, you know, forum at the school, you know, every, I know that my, my son, every Friday morning, the whole school would get together in the auditorium and there were all the special announcements and he volunteered to be the one on stage to kind of introduce everybody during those assemblies, I guess it would call them. even mm -hmm. that, right. Just to get experience being in front of people, right. And an audience and how to communicate um, is very important. Cause I think that ability to speak in public is something that it is terrifying to many people. Um, but the more, comfortable and the earlier you do it, the better it is, because that's a very important trait to have. So dreams, sure. dreams, important to have dreams, important to ask questions and seek help from others. 
and then uh, that public speaking and leadership whenever possible. Those would be my parting remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Such great advice and counsel. I mean, just looking at your journey, uh, it's truly inspirational. Uh, you have, you know, made it possible today for a lot of people to dream big, to establish goals and, and put in the hard work, knowing that it is possible if you're willing to put in the hard work, because that, mm -hmm. that's key, as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we thank you for your participation with us. You know, you um, have done so much. You've got, you know, this legacy that goes with you in terms of everything you've done. Um, you're a leader among leaders in a very sophisticated field, uh, probably the most sophisticated now, you know, going forward in, in our, in, you know, in, in the world. And it was just an honor and a privilege to have you with us today. Uh, thank you so much again. And, you know, uh, you know, best of luck. And I hope to see you sooner than the next five years. Oh, yes, please. Let's make sure we, we, we plan on that. And thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. Thank you again.